Through stories and songs, the life of the nomad has been romanticized through hundreds of years. Whether a historical account of the explorers who sailed across vast oceans or a Louis L'Amour novel about the lonesome cowboy who just drifted from town to town like the tumbling tumbleweed, there's something about the unrestricted lifestyle that appeals to us. Johnny Cash's song, Folsom Prison Blues, told the story of the prisoner who was haunted by the sound of the train that would give him freedom. Willie Nelson sang about being on the road again. <laughs> I've Been Everywhere was made famous by Hank Snow. No chains, no holds, no restraints, nothing to tie you down. Man, what a carefree lifestyle the nomad leads. John Hartford wrote a song that became a monster hit for Glenn Campbell, the song titled Gentle on My Mind. The lyrics speak to the mindset of those who would have none of the limitations that other people, that most people live with. The lyrics go like this. It's knowing that your door is always open and your path is free to walk that makes me tend to leave my sleeping bag rolled up and stashed behind your couch. And it's knowing I'm not shackled by forgotten words and bonds and the ink stains that are dried upon some line that keeps you in the back roads by the rivers of my memories that keeps you ever gentle on my mind. The relationship nomad that's being talked about in this particular song comes and goes as he pleases at this woman's home. Stopping in only when it's convenient, only when it's desirable for him. He apparently doesn't at all embrace the idea of marriage, of being shackled by forgotten words and bonds of vows, or the ink stains that are dried upon the lines of a marriage certificate. Where did mankind get this DNA strand that makes us want to break free, to have total freedom? We're going to look this morning at a few verses in Genesis to discover the answer to that compelling question. We're going to look back to the point where Cain has just slain his brother Abel. That's where we'll be picking up. We'll be in Genesis chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. God is speaking to Cain. He's addressing his, his sin right here. If you work the land, it will never again give you its yield. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. But Cain answered the Lord, My punishment is too great to bear. Since you are banishing me today from the soil, and I must hide myself from your presence and become a restless wanderer on the earth, whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord replied to him, In that case, whoever kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. And he placed a mark on Cain so that whoever found him would not kill him. Then Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Father, this morning we're just so grateful that we are in your presence. That your Holy Spirit fills this room and fills our heart. Lord, just speak to us today in a powerful way. Just enrich us fully. All this we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. There are two things that we see from Cain in this few, this few uh, number of verses we've looked at. First is disinterest. The, the phrase that he has here, my punishment is too great to bear. Since you are banishing me today from the soil, here's the key phrase, and I must hide myself from your presence. Who is walking away from whom in this situation? It's really not God kicking Cain out of his presence. Cain says, back to the verse, to the verse there please. Lord replied to him, in that case, whoever killed, uh, on back. Since you're banishing me today from the soil. See, God said, you're a farmer. You've been raising stuff. In fact, you brought me vegetables. You brought me fruits. Your brother brought me a meat offering. And you're not going to get anything from the ground in the future. You're going to have to work so hard. And you're going to get so little from it. Now, that's his punishment. But what does Cain do? Cain... Cain's not happy about this. I must hide myself from your presence. God didn't say, I never want to see you again. I don't want to lay eyes on you once more. 
Cain has no interest. The disinterest lies with Cain, not with God. Cain's just killed his brother. It's not a situation where God is banishing Cain from his presence because of this murder. When he con confronted Cain over this transgression, God handed down his punishment on the spot. Your life as a farmer is going to be so hard. The ground's going to give you so little. But that was the extent of the punishment that he gave him. God didn't say, you will never hear from me again. I'm not going to read any letters that you send me, Cain. Don't bother calling me. Don't text me. Don't send me a message on Facebook, Cain, because I'm not going to read them. God didn't say any of those things. In fact, it was just the opposite. Cain wasn't interested in God. Does that sound like mankind today? Not interested in God? See, Cain wasn't interested in fellowshipping with God or honoring God or in obeying God or in having God in his thoughts. He sees God as his oppressor rather than saying, maybe I did something wrong here. In fact, I did a lot wrong in my relationship with God and certainly with my brother. No, it's all on God from Cain's viewpoint. So he no longer has any interest in being involved with God. Cain said, I'm moving on. Can't you just picture Cain looking back over his shoulder toward Jehovah, singing maybe with a little touch of sarcasm, on the road again, just can't wait to get on the road again. Because he's got no interest now in God. This really describes much of mankind in every age. They prefer to roam alone with a godless life. What was it like for you way back when? When you didn't know God personally? How would you describe your life, the way you felt, your day-to-day your -day existence? How was it different then than it is now? Do you feel a greater sense of fullness? There's a purpose that you maybe can't always put into words, but you know God is giving you a purpose to be on this planet. You feel that no matter what's going on, that it's all under his wonderful plan. And that it's going to turn out okay. Doesn't mean everything here is going the way I want, but in the end, it's going to be okay. I mean, we didn't have that before. We often felt this sense of darkness. There's this foreboding of gloom and doom that's going to be ahead of us instead of knowing that there's sunshine on the other side Cain doesn't see that a lot of mankind is like that they do not want God in their life this is the attitude that keeps people away from church I know I'm supposed to go to church I was raised going to church but you know I really don't want God in my life so if I don't go where the church people are then I won't hear much about God so it keeps people away from church keeps people away from prayer. God might, might say something to me and I don't want to hear what he's got to say. He might talk to me about some of my transgressions like he talked to Cain about his. And I really don't want to hear that. I like doing the stuff that I do. And certainly it can keep us away from the word of God. Because God speaks to us so powerfully through his words. There have been times you and I have all done it. We know that you can read a verse that you've read dozens of times. And today, today, Oh, it speaks to you and it's convicting like it never convicted you before. So we will stay away from church. We'll stay away from prayer. We'll stay away from the Word of God. It's that attitude of wanting to live the goddess life that has forced God out of our schools. It has forced God out of our societies and has forced God out of our government. And this is the attitude that will bring damnation to the souls of people churches sometimes we get complacent because we're good we're good granddaughter's good great got two grandkids now have been been saved been baptized man we're doing well here but these other people i don't know about them you know i don't want, i don't have the time i don't feel like always investing the energy in them see that's that attitude because they don't really know about god like you and i do so we have this responsibility to help them understand that and to overcome this avoidance of God. What if we contrasted Cain and his disinterest in God with Moses? Moses who, you know, he's out there in the desert doing his thing, taking care of the sheep until God calls him and gives him a mission. Just like God's given each of us a mission. Moses so valued the presence of God that he just basically refused to go anywhere unless God 
went with him. We read in Exodus chapter 33 verse 14. Then he replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. If your presence does not go, Moses responded to him, don't make us go up from here. How will, be, how will it be known that I and your people have found favor in your sight unless you go with us? I and your people will be distinguished by this from all the other people on earth, on the face of the earth. Moses says, when you go with us, when your presence is with us, we are set apart from every other person on this planet. I don't want to go unless you're going with us, God. What a great thing that is. But we, sometimes we compartmentalize our life. Okay, I'm going to church. Okay, I want God to be there. Uh, if I'm going to have some prayer time, we're going to a Bible study, I want God to be there. And I'm going over here seeing this R-rated movie. Well, I don't necessarily want God to be there. Uh, you see how we compartmentalize? and We want God here, but not there. Instead of saying, I want God to be involved in everything that I do. Every aspect of my life. It's harder. But that's the way God wants us to be. Now we, like Cain, could say, you know, I'm going to walk away. But the fact of the matter is, no matter where we go, he is Emmanuel. God with us. Doesn't matter what I'm doing, where I'm going, he is with us. King David understood this fully, knowing he was always in the presence of the Lord. Psalm 139, verses 7 and 8. Where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. How good it is, how bad it is, God, I know you are there. How comforting is that for us? It gives me strength, it gives me reassurance knowing that no matter how bad I see things, God is there with me. Because we are his creation, there's this sort of deep longing we have within us that, that we want this relationship, a close relationship with God. But even with that, sometimes we avoid him just like Cain avoided him. There are various reasons that we have for avoiding God. First, we feel guilty and are afraid to face him. You remember when you, you got mad at that neighbor and you, you yelled at him and you told him, better never come on my property again. Remember those, those kind of things? Yeah, we, we, we do those, don't we? Or the person that cuts you off on the highway and you wave at them, only using one hand. <laughs> Remember? You see, we feel guilty. And then, oh gosh, I know what I did last Tuesday, and now I gotta go to church, and often these people are talking about confession, and well, they deserved it. They actually deserved what they got from me. And we don't want to face God. So we'll avoid church, we'll avoid prayer, and we'll avoid the Holy Word because it's convicting. Also, we will avoid God because we're disappointed by Him. God, I've heard I've had my broken hip, my knee is hurting, and it's been a year and a half, and I'm still hurting like this. You didn't give me what I prayed for, God. Because He is the fairy tale God, right? That whatever we ask for, He's supposed to just poof it up into existence. And when he doesn't, we're disappointed. <laughs> well, I'll just stay away then. Show you. Wasn't that what Cain was doing? We also avoid God. We're angry at him. We feel he's let us down. I was just thinking last night about the number of close friends we have who've lost spouses in the last year to year and a half. And sometimes it's a matter of saying, God, why? Why did you take them? They were such a good person and, and they were my soulmate and why did you take them? You, you let me down. So we'll avoid God. And finally, this might be a biggie, through churches worldwide, we're afraid that he's going to make unreasonable demands on us. You may recall, for those who get the newsletter or read that, that we talked in, I mentioned one recently about Rick and Teresa Dixon, friends of ours from over in Donaldson, that they knew they were called to Mission Aviation Fellowship. They were called to become missionaries. It's a different type than what Mark and Pam have done, but they were called to be missionaries. So when you go to some of these very, very third world countries, 
Here are these small planes that will take you into jungle areas, take you into remote areas. It, it would take you days and days to travel by car if you could get a car there. Well, they fly people in and out. That's their mission. And they were excited about this. God has opened this opportunity. It's a wonderful thing that he's called them to. They're both corporate types, engineers. And they're excited. And Teresa, she, she told us, I prayed, I prayed, God will go anywhere. God will go anywhere, 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 except Africa. And where do you think God sent them? Because God's got a great sense of humor. <laughs> oh, you said Africa. I heard you mention Africa. Oh, you want to go to Africa. Great, you're going to Africa. <laughs> And it turned into a wonderful experience for them. They were in Lesotho, down in the middle of South Africa, just a tiny postage stamp country. And then they moved up to Zaire. They, they had a wonderful experience there. But you see, so many of us, we're afraid he can make an unreasonable demand. You see, their kids were still in their teens. God, you, you want me to take my kids away from their friends, away from grandparents and brothers and sisters and cousins and all that are around? You, you want me to do that? You want me to give up my corporate job, big bucks, and go on the mission field? I, 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 God, I can't do that. We're disappointed. We will avoid God so that he won't make those kind of demands upon us. But if we don't, if we don't listen to God, and we don't respond to what he puts on our heart, not only do we miss out on blessing, but we may be costing someone an opportunity to come to know Christ personally. We can thank Adam and Eve for this evasive nature that we have. After they had their afternoon snack from the fruit basket, the Garden of Eden had been their idyllic sanctuary, and now it became their house of shame. Genesis 3, 8, we read, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at that time of the evening breeze. And they hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They hid from God. Cain decided he was going to walk away to hide from God. Now why did Cain do this? What was the story with him? It's a simple, stubborn nature that he was succumbing to. Whatever it said, you know, I don't like what you're doing, God, so I'm just going to buck up here and rebel. We read verses 13 and 14. We see defiance, but no repentance. We see blaming, but no acceptance of blame. We find a willingness to walk away from God rather than work on a walk with God. Cain thought, I'll be just fine without having God in my life. I'll be okay. I'll be out there. He thought that for just a moment. And then, what happened? My punishment is too great to bear. Since you are banishing me today from the soil, and I must hide myself from your presence and become a restless wanderer on the earth, here's where his concern kicked in. Whoever finds me will kill me. Oh, I don't need you, God. Oh, wait a minute. They're going to kill me when they find me. Suddenly, he saw he had another need for God in his life. Isn't it amazing? You know, we've all heard the phrase that there are no atheists in foxholes. Because when the bombs are falling, when the bullets are flying, you better find something to believe in. Because myself, even my soldiers around me, they, they may not be able to save me. I may not be intended to come out of this, but I better be believing in God. I need Him. And sometimes there's got to be in that desperate situation before we actually will admit that to ourselves. Cain admitted it right there. Lord, I need you. Because they're going to kill me. But he, just like Cain typically does, he didn't want responsibility for what went on. If we read this, Since you are banishing me today from the soil, whoever finds me will kill me. God, it's your fault. If somebody kills me, it's on you. Not that my offering wasn't acceptable. Not that I killed my brother. No, it's on you if they kill me. Instead of taking responsibility, he tried to shift the blame to the shoulders of God. Mankind is good at avoiding God, evading God. But what he tried to blame God for, it's not God's style. Matthew 5, verse 45. This talks about how God treats everyone on the planet. 
For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So Cain, yeah, he's still going to have some good things in his life, whether or not he deserved those. Cain thought, who needs God? There are a lot of people today who ask the same question. Who needs God? Who needs church? Mark Driscoll is the former lead pastor of Mars Hills Church in Seattle, Washington. He wrote in his book, The Relevant Church, about the importance of church in a person's life and how he personally discovered that truth. Occasionally, I would drop into church out of guilt. Sound familiar? I've done that. I understand. But I always walked away feeling as if I just wasted an hour with an ex-girlfriend. <laughs> I continued reading the Bible and seeing the New Testament was written by pastors of churches to churches about church life. And I was convinced there's no such thing as a personal, isolated relationship with Jesus apart from his often ugly bride, the church. Acknowledging my disinterest in the church as little more than arrogant judging, I decided to seek out a church where I could obey the scripture commands to go to church, Hebrews 10.25. Place myself under the authority of pastors, Hebrews 13.17. Use my abilities to build up the church, 1 Corinthians 14, 12. Partake of communion in a church, 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 34. And give my tithe to a church, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. I was finally starting to realize that Jesus died not just for me, but for his church, which I was a part of by his death and resurrection. You see, we do need the church just as much as we need God. Who needs a church? Here's a question that was submitted to the Billy Graham Daily News. It was published on April 29th, 2014, and Billy Graham's wonderful response. Here's the question that was sent in. I'm not interested in God. I can't understand why anyone would want to be. I have my own life to live, and I don't need God telling me what to do. Having God around would just be a bother. I had enough of God when I was a kid. Signed, C.D. Okay. Interesting. Maybe it's a world view that is more and more common. Do I really need God? So Billy Graham answered. Let me ask you a question. Are you honestly not interested in God? Or are you fighting against him? Only you can answer this, of course. But I can't help but feel that God is actually pursuing you. And you know it. And are doing everything you can to keep him away. Far from being uninterested in God, you're very interested in him. Because you're afraid of what will happen if he overtakes you. But why is God pursuing you? Is it to make you miserable and bring back whatever bad things you might have experienced as a child? No, not at all. God loves you and wants to make you into the person he created you to be. Jesus didn't come to make us miserable. He came to make our lives complete. And they will only be complete when we give up our shallow, self-centered ways and discover the life he has for us. Billy goes on to say, Jesus' words are true. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. John 10.10 10. But God is also pursuing you because he knows the road you're presently on will only lead to heartache and bitterness and death. Right now, you may not believe this, but it is true. Don't gamble with your soul, but face your need of God and have the courage to give your life to Christ. I've never met anyone who was sorry they gave their life to Jesus, and neither will you. For those who are interested, for those who respond and give their life to him, God's presence is our very lifeblood and our protection. Joshua 1 5 no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live I will be with you just as I was with Moses I will not leave you or forsake you if nothing else you look at it from self-preservation you say really you're gonna not leave me not gonna leave for not forsake me at all no he won't Ever have a bad day or maybe even a bad stretch of days in your life when things didn't go quite the way that you would hope and dream? Those who are downcast, 
They seek his presence. They find encouragement, even strength to praise him. Psalm 42, 5. Why am I so depressed? Why this turmoil within me? Put your hope in God, for I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. When we are in the presence of Jehovah, rather than like Cain, running from Jehovah, our life is so different. We're in control. We have things going on. And God is there with us. He doesn't leave us. He doesn't forsake us. Cain had disinterest in being with God. But that determines then where you will dwell. Cain left God to dwell in Nod. The Hebrew word translated Nod means to wander. How instructive is the meaning of this word? For when you leave the presence of God, you will indeed wander. Church, you stuck around. Well, things have changed because now, like we have in Southern California, we've got pastors that stay in churches for 30 or 40 years, and we've got congregations that go from church to church to church to church. <laughs> well, we wrote a song about that, and we call it the Church Hopping Blues. Who likes to roam around I'm never at one church I move around the town I visit and I hang out But to me they're all the same And most of the time the preacher Doesn't even know my name They call me the wanderer Yeah, I'm the wanderer I roam from church to church to church to church to church to church Well, there's some Baptists on my left And there's some Lutherans on my right The Pentecostals are the ones that, Yeah, that I'll be with tonight when they ask me which church it is I love the best I tell them it's the one that doesn't ask me to confess That I'm the wanderer, yeah I'm the wanderer I roam from church to church to church to church to church Well I roam from church to church My attendance it is the worst I go to church with So we can be the wonders as well. The question we must ask yourself, where will I dwell in 2015? Will I dwell with God or will I be a wanderer? Wandering is the inevitable result of leaving God's presence. You will wander from the right path. You will wander from true wisdom. You will wander from peace, from joy, and from safety for your soul. Leaving God's presence is going to empty you of those things that are most valuable in life. Nod may have money, popularity, and status, just like Cain had. Because when he left, he built a city. But Nod does not have God. Without God, all the other things you may have are worthless in terms of what really matters in life. So what about your life? Are you trying to get away from God? Are you trying to avoid spiritual matters? If so, you're headed for a change of address. Your new address will be Nod, and that's a bad place to live. Satan may be pulling on you, enticing you with the allure of the nomadic lifestyle, leading you to walk apart from Jehovah. Right now, make the commitment that 2015 will be the year of change in your life, the year when you move closer to your Creator, the year when you're fully in the presence of Jehovah.